Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you who have just connected to the first briefing of HLF Connect 2021. As just said in the film, uh, the HLF is an international network uh, that was set up in 2012 to, um, um, to provide a forum um, to share and discuss members' activities uh, on a wide range of topics, uh, as well as to learn from each other's innovation practices. Last year, a member in order to achieve the level of exchange between members of the HLF and also to reach beyond our community, we created HLF Connect, a series of interaction between ecosystem players organized within dedicated working groups on key topics of our time. In 2020, we focused HLF Connect on the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on ecosystem and societal resilience with the development of COVID-related innovations and new ways of working. This year, we, we wanted to continue to address the theme of societal resilience, but with a focus on the challenges facing industry. And we also wanted to connect to the theme of our high level forum summit in November, which is uh, the reinvention of industry in support of a resilient society. Today, uh, we are pleased to open our discussions with all of you uh, into sessions that represent uh, the end of the first phase of work uh, to not only understand some of the approaches that each ecosystem is taking, but how we can drive collaboration between HLF members and beyond. 11 organizations agreed to respond individually to two main questions on how they are taking action and how they are pooling their skills in favor of this industrial reinvention while taking into account the needs of our society and the profound transformation underway. As chair of the HLF, I am pleased to welcome the members of Working Group 2 to the second webinar of the day. Uh, since April, uh, this second working group has focused around local regional industrial reinvention, and we hope it will spur interest, discussion, and collaboration among the wider innovation community. Um, before giving uh, the floor to each of you in turn to present uh, the circumstances and drivers uh, faced uh, by you, uh, your ecosystem, I, I would like to, to make a round of introductions. I am very pleased to welcome Harry, uh, Harry Kumala. Um, Harry, you here. Yes, you here. You, you work uh, as the CEO of Dimec in Tampere. Uh, Dimec is the innovation platform of uh, Finnish uh, technology industry companies and research institute. Uh, Dr. Janikrishna uh, Kanata. Tanara, you are the executive director of the Eastern Economic Corridor of Innovation um, of Thailand and also one of the executive vice president of the National Science and Technology Development Agency of Thailand. Professor Richard Dasher, hi Richard. Uh, you are a director of the US Asia Technology Management Center at Stanford University. Uh, your research and teaching focus on the flow of people, knowledge and capital in innovation ecosystems, industry value chain, etc. Lucky us. <laughs> Uh, Veronique Pekinia, you are Director for International Actions in the Inward Investment Team Invest in Grenoble Alp at Greater Grenoble, France, and you represent the Grenoble ecosystem today. Thank you very much. Marcus Schluter, you are the Vice Director at Ruhr Region. You are also the CEO of the Business Metropole Ruhr in Germany. Welcome to the Ruhr. Uh, Brent uh, Lakeman, uh, as director of the Hydrogen Initiative for Edmonton Global, you lead the Metropolitan Region's activities to position it as Canada's preeminent hydrogen hub. 
And uh, later to the Essa Kokonen, uh, we will be happy to welcome you uh, uh, as uh, another representative from Finland. Uh, Essa, you are the CEO of the Baltic Institute of Finland, a leading organization for innovation cooperation in the Baltic Sea region. And you'll join us uh, in the second part, as I just said. So welcome to you all. And uh, before we start, I, I would like to remind you, if you could please keep to the 10 minutes allotted to leave time for our round table. Um, I would like to start with uh, Harry. Uh, Harry, uh, Tampere has been in continuous uh, industrial renewal uh, despite crisis. Um, what are the reasons for such success? How does Tampere ecosystem create growth? Harry, over to you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, I hope uh, you hear me well. Yes, perfect. Okay. Perfectly well. Dear friends, uh, good afternoon. Um, I, I talk today about the Tampere ecosystem uh, in, in total, but my focus will be uh, on on uh, industrial renewal and growth. It's um, a little bit amazing if I get the, the next slide, please. Uh, it's it's uh, a, a little bit amazing how a, a city of this north, as you can see, it's uh, uh, about three hours uh, or even more to the south of Europe, a very northern city where basically we do not have a night at all at this time of year. It's, it's only light uh, during all the night, uh, how there has been 250 years of growth in, in one single city. And uh, I will a little bit open up how this has been possible. Tampere is a small uh, city, about half a million population uh, in the, in the um, city region, uh, a little bit less than 400,000 people. Uh, it's estimated to grow uh, by 40%. Uh, uh, before 2030, uh, and uh, it's among the, the most popular uh, cities in Scandinavia where people want to move when they are asked, would you like to uh, live somewhere else where you live now? Okay, the, the city was established by King of Sweden uh, about 240 years again, uh, back to 240 years ago, and it has at the moment about 90,000 students, so one uh, fourth uh, at least from the, 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 the urban area, city, city uh, um, population is, is, is uh, students. There is 10% growth in the number of companies. It was before the pandemic and it has increased uh, after the pandemic. And um, this has been the industrial innovation city the, the textile industry was here, the mobile uh, phone industry was here, uh, a lot of things has been here, but after the collapses of the industries, people didn't move out. We didn't uh, suffer from the very bad times. There are plenty of innovations that has been uh, um, uh, carried out and done in, in Tampere region, and if I get the, the uh, next slide, uh, the, 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 the whole uh, region can be figured by moving in. So 75% of the current population, 75% of the, 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 the uh, city population has not been born in this city. And it's, it's, it's um, a little bit amazing in, in a country which is not a big. Finland only has 5.5 million people. The whole Scandinavia has 25 million people. And we were based on the textile industry. First 200 years of the city was textile industry. It all collapsed in the 70s because of the cost pressure which arrived through the industrialization of Asia. Then we invested in mobile phones and the biggest ever Finnish led company, Nokia, they were established in this city. They, they uh, increased their businesses here 
but it all collapsed uh, a little bit more than 10 years ago, about 10 years ago in 2010s. During the flourishing of these two businesses, the, the city, it somehow managed to attract a balanced set of mechanical engineering, software-based industries from many sectors, social health, medical industry, game industry, mobile work machines, laser sensors, whatever you can imagine of measurement. And the cultural built-in in the city somehow explains why innovation is so uh, important and so um, flourishing, because we are a little bit similar to what is experienced in the west of US, in, in the Silicon Valley. The history of Tampere city is based on moving in. People move in. The city is rather young, young 240 years in European setup is rather young, and there has been growth for whole 240, 250 years. And newcomers, they are taken naturally and rather fast to the decision making and all the discussion groups and all the inter internal participant groups. Uh, there is no putting people outside or putting people into boxes. And it's a little bit different in some other regions of, of this country. If I may have the next slide, uh, what has been established after the textile or during the flourishing of textile industry, during the growth of Nokia mobile phones business. In the side, we developed the largest concentration of mobile machinery in Europe, for example. You see some of the global logos, global leaders. They have market positions from one to four in their uh, businesses. And they sell all over the world. They are totally global, even thought the origins are in this city. If I may have the next slide. Um, what drives this kind of industrial work? It seems to be the business ecosystems, organizing all sizes of companies to work together, especially with the universities, especially with the smaller startups, and uh, trying to boost, um, if, if not even competitors, but almost, even the competitors. So there is a say that if it's harder to go into the national hockey team than to go into the professional teams, then the competition increases uh, the, the quality of everybody's play. And that might be the truth. For example, we at DMAC, we lead three of the uh, industrial ecosystems specialized in autonomous maritime businesses, intelligent industry and, and uh, um, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence in industry and 3D printing, for example, additive manufacturing. So global business potential for everybody, but very, very local R&D input, uh, especially located in Tampere, maybe in some other locations in Europe as well. This has somehow been the, 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 the uh, industrial key for the renewal. And if I may have the last slide, what, what I feel as a cultural key in, in, in Tampere, not only in the um, operations of, of, for example, our company, but, but uh, in, 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 in the city, the, the challenger position inside Finland has been very, very important because never in the history of the city, Tampere has enjoyed any kind of governmental support. It has not been the capital. It has not been receiving any significant uh, governmental funding or specific uh, role. Uh, there, there were some business privileges in the 18th century in the beginning, but nothing after that. All things basically have been initiated and developed in the city by the citizens, by the actors. Secondly, the city has been very, very politically led by tandem, which is non-traditional. It has been the left wing and the right wing at the same time in the lead, especially the last 100 years. So it's not possible in many 
cities. It's either the left or either the right. But in this city, I do not know why, but it has been some kind of agreement that let's make decisions together. And they have made like pragmatic decisions, no ideology, ideology inside at all. Or the left wing decides every second decision and the right wing every second, which means that it, it, it goes uh, rather non-systemically non uh, systemically in, in balance. So the structure is almost impossible in most of the cities. I would recommend after this kind of history, but I do not know how to make it happen. Ambitiousness has dominated. So people in this city, they always target being the European leaders, being the first, being the biggest. It's re really ambitious. Let's not try to be better than the, the guys in the next city, but let's try to be at least the best in Europe. If the others say it's impossible, let's do it. That has been the attitude. And last but not least, I would say that the public-private partnership model has worked really, really much and pretty well in this city. It has been in education, in research, in large construction. Uh, we have copied, by the way, the Australian public-private partnership model to construction of large sites, for example, tunnels, huge um, renewal of uh, city regions, city areas, and so on. Innovation, healthcare, culture, sports. PPP model is everywhere there. And it seems that it's also pragmatic. As long as we save time, as long as we save taxpayers' money, everybody seems to be happy and the participation is open so it's not close to loop single thing but it's open everybody is taken inside this forces and encourages the growth of the city this is small message from a small city with a very very nice growth history how to create growth thank you very much Oh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Harry. Uh, small city, uh, big f present and big future. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you very much for, for sharing the Tampere's keys of success. Let's switch continents and go from Europe to Asia. If Tampere's strategy combines uh, public-private uh, partnerships and attracting talent, uh, Jenny Krishna, what about the model you, you are developing uh, in Thailand, a model that has its roots uh, in the eastern part of Thailand? Jenny Krishna, you've got 10 minutes. Right. Thank you, Karen. Okay. So good morning and good afternoon and also good evening to everyone. Right. My talk today is about how we use an ecosystem approach to support industry reinvention and regional development in an inclusive manner in Thailand. The regions of focus is, as Karen says, the eastern regions of Thailand. May I have the next slide, please? Okay, the eastern regions of Thailand is well known for its three strong characters. First, it is the industrial powerhouse of Thailand, based on oil and gas, petrochemicals, automotive assembly and part. And second, the region is one of Asia's top tourist destination. Uh, Pattaya Beach in particular is well known among vacationers coming to this part of the world. And third, this eastern region is also one of the tropical fruit and seafood paradise in Asia. Fruits like durians, mangosteens and mangoes are particularly famous in domestic and international market. However, uh, after years of steady and successful development, the region faced some systemic uh, challenges. First, the region needs to upgrade its industries to the next level and migrate to new and more innovative industries. Second, the region, as well as the nation as a whole, has entered aging societies. As of such, uh, the workforce scarcities will be a compound problem, both in terms of needed skills and availabilities of workforce. And third, the industrial sectors and service sectors and agricultural sectors are competing 
for resources, sustainability to the environment as well as sustainability in a sense that no one is be left behind in the new developments issues. May I have the next slide, please? To this need, initiate uh, a mega project called Eastern Academic Corridors or EEC to rejuvenate the Eastern regions and address its challenges. The EEC initiatives aim at boosting the nation and the region's economic growth uh, based on technology intensive industries as well as enhancing its uh, inclusive growth and green growth. Under the umbrellas of the EEC, an innovation ecosystem called the Eastern Economic Corridors of Innovations or EECI is set up in a public private partnership manner to be the innovation arm supporting the endeavors of the EEC. Next, please. We locate the main campus of EECI at the heart of the Eastern regions on a 550 hectare land plot called the Bangjan Valley. The valley is already a home to a research university, a high school of the gifted, and a reforestation demonstration centers. With the uh, setup of EECI, the innovation zones as well as the new community zones are added to the Wangchan Valleys to facilitate the innovation ecosystem development around the EECI headquarters. Next, please. And to support the regional industrial transformations, the government has invested in several key translational research infrastructures under the umbrellas of EECI, shown in this slide. Today, I will talk about two of them. That is the uh, biorefinery pilot plants and the demonstration sites. Next, please. Uh, in terms of the biorefineries, we aim to manage most of the, uh, uh, in, uh, I'm sorry, let me uh, back a little bit. Uh, in When I'm talking about all the infrastructures, we aim to manage most of the infrastructures at the EECI as services infrastructures, meaning that everyone can access the facilities. In addition, each and every uh, one of these infrastructures are to be surrounded by various innovation ecosystem components so that the EECI become a comprehensive ecosystem supporting the uh, respective industries. And in the case of the biorefinery uh, industries, uh, the biorefinery pilot plant that the government is investing uh, is going to be a multi-purpose generation open access pilot plants so that research output can be scaled up and advanced technology from abroad can be localized using these facilities. The first thing that we do uh, in, in setting up these pilot plants is to set up uh, a professional management systems and we uh, we do that by teaming up with a European partner to set up a JV management companies. We also start setting up joint research partnerships. Uh, the first being the partner uh, partnership with a European research institute and local research institutes and local firms to facilitate localization of European technology into Thailand and ASEAN market. Joy Labs and Center of Excellence are also being explored at the moment to ensure steady supplies of homegrown technologies. The quality infrastructures necessary for the certification of the output from the pilot plants are also set up or linked up. Proprietary technology providers are also invited to set up their demonstrations next to the pilot plants so that customers can try out and compare results. Funding and innovation agencies in Thailand are also engaged to provide funding both on the research scale up as well as on the market trial run. Communication to domestic and international users to make sure that, the, uh, that they are aware of the facilities and the ecosystem that we are uh, building up uh, in the planning stage and should be launched after COVID-19 demand-led consortium for research institute or universities to the international counterparts uh, explore and set up whenever possible. 
Okay, so that is something we are uh, doing uh, in terms of creating the eco ecosystem around the infrastructure we have. And next, uh, as I next slide, please. And as I mentioned earlier, that the eastern regions is a tropical fruit paradise. Among the many fruits in the regions, durian is the most important to the local economies. And traditionally, durian tree consume lots of water, up to 1,000 liters per tree per day. With the expansion of the industrial and service sectors, water is a needed community for everyone and tensions can easily arise in drought season or when water is not properly managed. And also labor issues follow the same track as, uh, as the water issues. And farm, farming sector is on the losing end when it comes to competition for workforces. From day one of the ECI inception, we work with a number of durian orchards in the areas to introduce a smart farming technology to the orchard owners. In the process, we also integrate their local wisdom in the system. For example, they know that the birds are at certain conditions for a certain duration. Durian flower can bloom off seasons. And we so uh, we add sensors to help them monitor the microclimate and soil moisture in the orchards and create a mobile applications that the farmers can monitor various parameters from their mobiles. And from that same applications, farmers has a choice of manual, manually watering their durian trees or having the system auto automatically uh, water the trees for them. And after three years of working together with the farmers, the use of the technologies spread from a few trees in an orchard to several hundred of durian trees in several orchards in the areas. And the general result is that the use of water is reduced by 90% from 1,000 liters to roughly 90 liters per tree per day. And that is a lot of water uh, saving when, you, when we talk about several hundred trees. In addition, we also see significant labor reductions for example, uh, the, this particular orchard owner shown in the pictures, he was able to get by with his 50 acres orchard without having to hire any laborers during the few months of COVID-19 situation last year. And yet he still has a more productive output than the year before. Next, please. And despite the success of the technology demonstrations, we fully aware that we cannot keep demonstrating and implementing the smart farming system of, uh, from, from orchard to orchard. The way forward that we, th that we choose to do is to set up a demonstration site for the smart farming technologies. On one hand, we can receive visitors and spread the words around uh, more properly. And on the other hand, for those who are keen to embrace the technologies, we can train and turn them into smart farmers as well as help them set up uh, their service houses that can provide the system according to the requirement of the uh, smart farmers. We can also educate the local government officers to be our promoters so that they can act as liaison in promoting the systems. With this thinking, we hope that uh, we can eventually create a market-driven smart farming industry where demand and supply drive the development of one another. And next, please. And finally, I think there are many opp opportunities for partnership between us here. For example, we are looking for partners who would like to localize the advanced technologies uh, in Thailand and ASEAN market. We also look for partners that can help us globalize advanced products from our local bio resources. We can also support joint research partnership between international firms, research institute and their local counterpart in Thailand. And we definitely can share the, uh, the use of advanced infrastructures in EECI with you guys. Also, we, uh, we think joint development of talent can be part of any kind of collaboration that we have. And finally, instead of transaction by transaction collaborations, uh, why don't we explore innovation ecosystem partnership together? 
and last but not the least, any win-win partnership arrangement, I think it worth it is worth explorations. And thank you very much for your attention. Karen, I return the floor thank to you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny Krishna, and, and in particular for, for the last slide, uh, this call for collaboration is really the purpose of uh, the roundtable we're going to have later on. Uh, so it seems that the reinvention of the of industry is intimately included in your model, Jenny Krishna. So let's move now to North uh, America and precisely uh, to an era home to many of the world's largest high-tech corporations. Richard, uh, what's the news from uh, Silicon Valley and what act players act for industrial uh, transformation in the Valley? The floor Karen, is yours. Thank, you thank you very much for the introduction. Greetings, everyone. So I want to talk about industrial transformation in Silicon Valley. The concept of transformation means that something existed before it was transformed. Then it was changed. What Silicon Valley is famous for is on the next slide. Next slide, please. So Silicon Valley is actually famous more for startups and venture capital, which are focused on industry creation more than on industry transformation. So there are many startup companies in Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is driven by technology intensive innovation. 15% of America American patents came from Silicon Valley last year. It's a rapid growth approach to startup company creation and, and growth. We have about half of all of the unicorn companies in the United States. And uh, this reflects a very highly educated, but also very mobile workforce, many of whom came from somewhere else. 64% of our workforce was uh, born in a foreign country. So you see that Silicon Valley is very robust in creating new things. If I can see the next slide, please. But that's only part of the industrial landscape here. If uh, the startup companies are creating things, many of them are causing uh, older industries to lose market share. So this, you know, an entrepreneur being an agent of uh, creative destruction is definitely what's happening on the startup company side. But the problem is that a successful startup company becomes a large firm, which means that it is susceptible to disruption by the next generation of startup companies. In order to survive, a successful X startup company really has to keep evolving. I see this picture of the Apple campus, and I'm reminded of Western movies where the wagon train is attacked by Indians and they all have to circle the wagons. I wonder what Apple is afraid of being attacked by. The large firms in Silicon Valley are a major part of the economy. 38 of the Fortune 500 companies are located in the San Francisco area. This includes a few traditional giants, but a lot of, the, a lot of them are very new companies. Uh, next slide, please. So you the top 12 most valuable companies in Silicon Valley as of just a few days ago. And if you look at this, only one of the top 12 was founded before 1970, Visa. And actually, they moved in from somewhere else a few years ago. Four of the companies were founded between 1970 and 1990. And the other of the other seven companies in the top 12 were founded after uh, the year 1990. So like companies everywhere, like big companies everywhere, big companies in Silicon Valley have to find ways to continue to grow in this era of very rapid change. New technologies are creating new business models because the whole basis of the, co the company customer relationship has changed. And frequently a company has to change not only the products it delivers, but really its whole stance, its whole kind of focus and core of being. You see this rather frequently. Um, Actually, Apple started out as a computer company. Let's go back, please. 
go back one slide, please. Thank you. So Apple started as a computer company, but has moved on to become a um, really a provider of access to internet services through uh, cell phones. Anyway, uh, the second thing that big companies in Silicon Valley have to do is to uh, compete with startup companies. Am I lost? People can hear me or not. Yes, yes, you, you're still with us, Richard. Oh, I think we, we lost Richard. Or maybe, maybe Richard, you just uh, left the, the stage. Your your back, okay. So we'll we'll wait for you. Yes. Sorry, I'm back. <laughs> You're back, great. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So anyway, the big companies have to compete with startups, which are very attractive uh, for for the labor market. And if they're very successful, they may face uh, pushback from society or from government uh, because they went ahead with their business development without thinking sufficiently about social issues. Next slide, please. So to, no, one back. The um, companies really try to manage this process by having open innovation relationships, especially with startup companies. So company internal research and development is going to be focused on continuing the business that it has but the large companies are doing a lot of proof of concept demonstrations and joint ventures with startup companies. Those focus on areas that they know are of interest to their business, but maybe outside the current business. They're also doing acquisitions. If they acquire a big firm, like when Google just bought Fitbit this past, um, actually in January this year, uh, they're really repositioning the company immediately into a new market. That's not exactly innovation. If, however, they buy a startup company and Alphabet buys eight or 10 startup companies every year now, uh, they're really buying something that they know is in their critical path at the most optimum time after the innovation that the venture investors had paid for to incubate is somewhat de-risked. The large companies are doing corporate venture capital. This is a very active feature of Silicon Valley. About 30% of all uh, venture capital investments here are corporate venture capital strategic. And you see a lot of company incubators. So there are all these techniques that the large companies are using to cooperate with startup companies in order to gain the unique perspectives of the startup company. Next slide, please. So in Silicon Valley, industry reinvention in some ways is a natural process that plays on the complementary roles of large companies and a robust startup company ecosystem. The direction of change is really determined by the balance of power that exists between the entrepreneurs, the investors in the entrepreneurs companies, and the big firms who are buying output from the startup companies who have market clout that kind of force the car startup companies in certain directions. The public sector really plays a role primarily on infrastructure. They're very concerned about keeping the area livable, and we have some severe problems in the Silicon Valley area now. Housing prices are too high for basic service providers like teachers and nurses. Transportation was absolutely horrible before the pandemic, and it's getting that way again. Um, the income disparity in Silicon Valley is a severe uh, concern because it causes lack of access to education and further polarizes the population. The other thing that the public sector is doing is trying to keep the valley attractive to business, despite high taxes, despite high labor costs and high real estate costs and complex regulations. The local governments have various uh, consultation services and various ways that they have to make things sweet for 
companies. The national government is playing a role by having research and development funding that's available, and this is primarily competition-based, but it's an important part of the infrastructure. The academic side of the infrastructure here is really creating the next generation of the labor force, either the leaders, uh, the people who will be leaving the universities with research and development output that can be commercializable, or the regional universities, which are essential to have a sufficient workforce in the region. Next. So I think that it's important to remember that this model of an innovation-driven economy could not exist without access to much larger markets and resources. We access global markets to have sufficient revenue to continue large-scale innovation. We have to have access to global talent to really make sure that we have some of the best ideas in the world coming from this region. And we have to have access to other innovation ecosystems so that we can see other models of growth, so that we can see new opportunities. The uh, need for our global connections has actually intensified because now we all face global problems like COVID-19 or climate change. And it's also worth noting that the Silicon Valley model of innovation hasn't changed a lot for the last 30 years. Sometimes it needs a little bit more innovation itself. We're seeing interesting movement in areas of ESG investing, impact investing, concerns about broader social impact, and also more awareness of the perceptions of data-driven business and the needs to uh, really avoid ethical problems and uh, privacy problems before they ever happen. So from other innovation ecosystems, we hope to learn more about these other models, models that focus on slower growth, but more sustainable growth, social and infrastructure solutions, other models of regional innovation systems so that we can stay in touch with global developments. I think that this is really what I'm hoping for from the high level forum. And we've seen great cooperation. I've learned so much in the years I've been involved. Look forward to continuing this process. Thank you, Karen. You're very welcome. Thank you, Richard. And thank you for sharing the, the Silicon Valley recipe. Uh, I understand that it is evolving and uh, so the meal will still be delicious and I look forward to, to taste the new uh, uh, Silicon, uh, the new Valley's uh, recipe. So when you do an internet search for Brunovo, uh, whatever the search engine, you come across uh, articles that mention Brunovo as the, the Silicon Valley of the Alps. I think I know the reason, but Veronique, uh, would you tell us the history of industry in Grenoble through the ages? Veronique, up, over to you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly well. Okay, I had a few connection issues, so I hope uh, this uh, will work uh, smoothly. So, uh, hello everyone, good afternoon and good morning. Uh, and it's really my pleasure today to share uh, some of our um, uh, case studies, some of our history about industry and how it is very important to uh, connect industry with innovation, with global uh, the market as well as uh, with uh, local communities so if i go to next slide uh, i'd like to take first a look back uh, oops sorry i have to go back back okay a look back into our uh, history because here if you can see uh, for a few examples what i'd like to point out is in our uh, alps uh, innovation uh, and uh, inventions always led to industrial um, processes to industrial innovation as well and that's always been the case so you have a few examples with materials with concrete for example and of course with our post child i would say uh, who is aristide berges uh, uh, who came up with the invention of hydropower a few kilometers away from grenoble 
and really started the whole industrial history in our valley uh, with hydropower, then electricity, then electrochemistry, leading then to electronics, nanotechnologies, and renew coming back then, then to renewable energy. If we go to the next slide, and uh, I don't need to uh, detail more. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we can see that it's really all relevant with what we uh, named the triple helix innovation model. You've had some movies and some videos about giant, and this is exactly what it's all about with research, education, industry, collaborating very closely together with a really high priority porosity between these three forces. And it's really embodied here in the giant innovation campus, which is also an urban district. If I go to uh, the next slide, please. Um, and what I wanted here with my presentation was really to illustrate this with two case studies. Uh, with different histories. Uh, first, with one history about the uh, set, the, the scaling up of a factory or the setting up of a factory uh, and examples of Grenoble through the ages. So the first one will be of a global company uh, which has been around for quite uh, some time and has really undergone some massive investment lately. And the second one in a different sector is about a spin-off uh, from one of our really um, uh, top innovation research centers, uh, which is about to, uh, to really uh, enter a full-scale production and uh, undergoing uh, really a transformation, a disruptive uh, transformation and uh, wanting to, uh, to reshore some of uh, the display industry. If we go to the next slide. Next slide, okay. So the first story is about BD, which uh, was once called Beckton Dickinson, which uh, is a US-based company uh, but that's been around uh, locally for quite uh, some time. You can see with the figures that it's really a major uh, actor in the uh, med tech industry with a very strong foothold uh, locally in the French Alps and uh, one of the top employers as well. And uh, that's uh, from the 1950s. Uh, producing uh, devices that will just speak to just about anywhere, anybody, especially now with the current sanitary uh, context, uh, with 350 million pre-filled syringes produced here on site uh, per year. If we go to the next slide. What is important about this story is about how you keep uh, a local industrial momentum in a global economy. If we look at the market about uh, the pre-filled uh, syringes, you can see that it's a huge market. Uh, why is it so? Because uh, it just lowers the risk of errors and manipulation. It enables accurate drug dosing and you can see also that with the current uh, COVID-19 vaccination campaign, uh, this need is only go going to get higher and higher. Uh, so the uh, what's interesting here also is that the historical site in Pontley was actually the one that came up with all the production process for these pre-filled syringes, uh, starting with in the 1950s with the first machine, the first equipment that was used actually to manufacture these syringes. And then they've kept on through the years uh, with investing, investing in R&D with really a steady momentum of almost 30 uh, million euros uh, for R&D per year. If we get to the next slide, please. Okay, so from these 1950s uh, all the way to the latest investment, uh, which actually happened before the pandemic, but which was really useful foresight, uh, and then uh, that came up with uh, almost uh, well, 200 million uh, dollars invested in this uh, local site. This site has managed to stay as an excellent center with a close link every time between R&D and production. And when, 
when I'm talking about R&D and innovation, I'm not only talking about innovating about the product, I'm also talking about innovating about the process. For example, coming up with a way to use less water, uh, checking you know, uh, what in the uh, process was using more water and uh, deciding to, for example, to change the washing machines or whatever it is. Then they manage also to keep very closely with the local support system, local, regional or national, and with the local authorities. This site is really inserted in a highly densely populated area, even though it's a Cefeso uh, site. So you can imagine how that might be tricky uh, when it comes to actually investing and uh, extending the site. Um, and basically the investment has been both private but also leveraging on some public support especially when it comes for example to uh, complying to compliance with new environment uh, regulations so what we have um, what is important to to get from this experience is the fact that um the, the um, innovation, the whole process, uh, and the importance of connecting with the medical community as well. And also uh, the, uh, the fact that um, the, these innovation coming sometime, stemming sometimes from um, constraints, for example, by the environment, will actually, um, will actually come up with new innovations, new technology innovations about the production. For example, they've uh, started, for example, to, 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 uh, to improve the waste uh, recycling process and this in turn will be extended to uh, the uh, the other uh, manufacturing sites worldwide so this is really a virtuous cycle i would say if i go to my next slide and then we'll just pass on to a new sector uh, the other examples I wanted to to uh, to highlight was one of Aledia, which is really a disruptive LED technology startup, uh, which uh, was founded uh, 10 years ago only, uh, and as a spin-off from the Leti uh, Research Innovation Center in Microelectronics. Uh, it's only 10 years old, but it has already managed to have quite impressive round, uh, rounds of funding uh, and uh, employs more than 130 people nowadays has already one pilot line and in, is in the process of actually um, setting up its first production line. And this is, I have to mention, this is a highly risky and uh, touchy uh, step for such a startup because we are here in a highly um, intensive, highly technological as well as capital uh, industry as well. So if we go to my next slide, which is, uh, I won't comment everything because, but this is just a reminder as well, because here we are really in a market that's highly competitive. So first of, of all, Europe had once a leadership position in the, the display industry. Then everything went, not, uh, not south, I would say, but um, east, uh, when it started with the uh, flat panel industry that needed to be hosted in huge manufacturing sites with uh, uh, panel, uh, glass panels of uh, huge dimensions as well. And then Elidia came up with a very disruptive innovation with uh, nanowires that were, are grown uh, on a silicon substrate and which we were process, we the process, which is compatible with semiconductor process. And here in Grenoble, we are good at semiconductors. That's really one of our specialty. So this is really here, they are able to come up with products that will be smarter because they will add intelligence at the pixel level that will be brighter, that will also be more energy efficient. So uh, this is really now is an opportunity to be right on time for the market, uh, for a new market and to address some new markets as well. And maybe if we do this really uh, in a very uh, intelligent way to be able to reshore some of this industry along with the supply chain in Europe. If we get to my next slide. 
And uh, I just uh, want to, to show here how this was supported and the choices that were made, the strategic, and how they still have one way to go. So basically, they were able to, uh, to, um, to have support and to leverage support from a national standpoint with the ART NanoELEC, which were able to support them in the proof of concept uh, first, and then also into securing uh, some of the supply chain and some of the really uh, the touchy uh, steps as well. Then they also uh, decided to focus on one specific step of the industrial uh, process, which is epitaxy. And this allowed them to concentrate the funding on this particular step and let uh, some other actors, such as foundries, and uh, people from Taiwan will know what I'm talking about, uh, foundries will invest about three quarters of the rest. And this is indeed this makes it compatible with a startup uh with a, being a startup because otherwise in this industry it's just too expensive it's just too capital intensive and then they took advantage as well of having the uh, local and the regional support uh were able to be hosted and choose the site the industrial site and that was actually done during the first lockdown which was no main uh, feat uh and uh, take advantage of the retrofitting of a former chemical part, which meant also the possibility of a Cerezo permit because uh, they need some uh, heavy chemical products, and to have also a strong local and regional support in the securing of um, some specific private and public loans for the, uh, especially for the the uh, the real estate and the and the building. And also, one very key uh, important point was able to was being able to uh, leverage the national support of the uh, French tech because uh, Aledia is really highlighted in the, as one of the top uh, French uh, French tech um, uh, startup. And you can see here a picture of uh, the CEO uh, speaking a few days ago with uh, French President Emmanuel Macron and, and pointing out how important it is to think of the startups also in the how uh, they are going to secure their financing when they actually scale up uh, full to industrial uh, dimension. But it's only the beginning, and what uh, the CEO was saying actually was that they need to be supported for quite a long time and uh, on a European level, because otherwise it's just uh, the, the story is just going to repeat itself. So if I want to, to conclude into, uh, for these two examples and how we can take uh, uh, some of the, uh, the, the, uh, some lessons away, uh, first of all, uh, and it's very important, and that doesn't mean we don't welcome uh, global uh, cooperation because that's a global industry and we need to think glo uh, globally, but we must think of on a European level with a European source supply chain. That's very important. We need also to uh, keep the IP and the innovation very close to the production and to the production process. Uh, in order to really uh, the, to, to really uh, be able to have this uh, closed loop of innovation, then we need to anchor um, uh, our industrial sites within and here in Europe and in Asia, I guess it's the same within highly uh, and densely populated regions, and that's very tricky because it means you have to uh, get population acceptance with environmental issues that need to be addressed very openly. Uh, you need to uh, assess the opportunities for local jobs. You need to have an ecosystem effect, drawing on the upstream, of course, collaboration, but also you need to point out the uh, spillover effect with local retails, for example. And then what's important here in our, in our developed countries is really that we need to make the compliance with a very demand, demanding environmental regulation uh, that is only bound to increase, we need to uh, actually turn this around into assets and have to positive know-how because it's absolutely important for uh, uh, population acceptance because there will be ever more issues about accessing um, natural resources such as water supply, minerals or other raw materials because it just also will enable us to have really to, to set up a circular economy 
And with this, uh, you, we will in turn uh, translate the, these into uh, new technologies as well. And then we need also to favor the retrofits of buildings, industrial sites, rather than taking over new agricultural or natural land surfaces. So this is uh, what um, the most of what I had to say, and this is done, and this is very important too, this is done only when you exchange uh, know-how, when you exchange uh, best cases, and uh, when you uh, learn from each other's uh, case studies. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Veronique. Um, well, for, for a city we, with one in five uh, inhabitants working directly in uh, research technology and innovation, uh, reinventing uh, our industry seems to be part of our DNA. Uh, and a constant concern for for all um, of all of the actors of uh, the ecosystem, including um, the public uh, authorities, uh, local and national, and European, and sh should include local population, as you said. Well, I would like to stay in Europe, uh, and for this, uh, I'm looking at a region in Germany, which is the, the largest industrial area in Western Europe. Uh, Marcus, uh, how is the rural metropolitan region, the city of the cities, reinventing its industry uh, through hydrogen technologies? Marcus, the floor is Thank yours. You. Thank you, Karen. Uh, hello to everyone on the screens. It's a pleasure for me to be with you today. The metropolis Ruhr is uh, in the heart of Europe, uh, in the western part of uh, Germany and in the center of the federal state of uh, North Rhine, Westphalia. The Ruhr Regional Association has an over 100 year long history, so we can say we are the experts in structural change. We are actively shaping the transformation. Today, former sites of the steel and the mining industries have become locations for new companies, for cultural events and for leisure experiences. The Industrial Heritage Trail is internationally renowned and networked with uh, over 26 anchor points, including the Zollverein World Heritage Site in Essen. So this trail, which attracts over one uh, over eight million visitors to the region each year, was started in 1999. The Ruhr metropolis is one of the largest polycentric metropolitan economic regions in the European Union. In the past, coal and steel were the core of the production. So the steel production is very energy demanding. So local production of energy allowed efficient supply change with coal as primary source for energy supply. So the Ruhr metropolis was the heart of the German industrialization and look back of decades of experience in energy production and in energy manufacturing. The Ruhr metropolis has transformed into a unique business hub. Overall, there are about 22 universities and many independent research facilities. There are over 300,000 students applied, mainly in engineering, in economics, in social studies, and in law. So Metropolis Ruhr has a lively startup culture. In the past 10 years, many companies from the energy and from the health sector transitioned into the Metropolis Ruhr. The economic also transformed away from a production dominance into a strong service-oriented tertiary sector. The companies are working closely connected to the universities and research facilities, thus creating an interdisciplinary networking system. So the impetus that forced structural change is based uh, on many points. Since the late 1960s, the demand for coal drastically dropped because oil became popular and was relatively more cheap compared to coal. So German coal was relatively more expensive compared to coal from international competitors. So the mining industry, the metal sector and the steel production have been dominant industries, but uh, have strongly declined. The coal and the steel production had a very high carbon dioxide output and the pollution levels in the area exceeded the value that accepted as valid by the German government. 
So German government joined the Paris Agreement in uh, 2015 in succession of the Kyoto Protocol in 1997 and vowed to reduce its carbon dioxide emissions by a sig significant margin. We are on our way to transform the industry. The task is to replace coal as an energy supplier with green energy. The European Green Deal 2020 sets the agenda for the urgent adaption of economic processes and value chains to the challenge of climate change. Its key objectives are to set the net greenhouse gas emissions to zero in 2050 and transform the European economy to a clean and to a circular economy that is able to reach economic growth without use of non-renewable resources and greenhouse gas emissions. To utilize renewable energy, we need hydrogen. Hydrogen can be used as a storage for energy and therefore comprehend for fluctuations in the weather-dependent energy output of renewable energies. So North Rhine-Westphalia has the highest greenhouse gas emissions among the German federal states and therefore a particular need for innovative solutions to manage the profound transformation process. The goals until 2045 in the metropolis rule is reduce carbon dioxide output by 55%, production of the necessarily volume of green hydrogen corresponding to the carbon dioxide reduction, and at least create new jobs. So we have challenges in the past. We have to finding alternatives for coal. We are dealing with mission infrastructure for green energy supply and intensive uh, companies to spend more money on hydrogen research and development. So the challenges today is uh, the, research, the, the research is already done, but the question is how to transfer the theoretical knowledge into practice. So we have to build bridges across all the economic agents, the researchers, the companies, the politicians, and the consumers, of course. So the utilization of the existing gas infrastructure for hydrogen distribution. We have to do all of the points above while preserving the environmental and local industrial culture. So all of this has to be done in a short amount of time because otherwise the rural metropolis will lose its favorable position against international competitors. So the regional innovation ecosystem plays a significant role for the transformation of the economy. The defined lead markets are digital communication, mobility, healthcare, urban construction and living, resource efficiency, education and knowledge, leisure, leisure and event, and sustainable consumption. Because of the close connection of research and firms, new findings get transferred into the economy relatively fast. North Rhine-Westphalia and the metropolis Ruhr has the densest polycentric science and research landscape in Europe. The universities, for example, Dortmund, Bochum and Duisburg-Essen are the largest traditional public universities in the Ruhr metropolis and form the Research Alliance Ruhr. Moreover, there are a large number of extramural research institutions such as Fraunhofer or Max Planck Institutes. The big world players of the energy sector and heavy industry decided to stay in the rural metropolis even after the end of the coal exploitation. So Aeon, RWE, ThyssenKrupp, Ivonic or Air Liquide. So beneficial for the metropolis rural is the widely spread gas infrastructure that can be utilized to distribute hydrogen. Due to its central location and the polycentric st uh, structure, the rural metropolis is an important hub for traffic and transport with powerful network of motorways with public transport with rails and waterways, including the largest inland port in Duisburg and the largest canal port in Dortmund in Europe. So due to the decades in energy and heavy production, skilled workers with high level potentials of experience live in the rural metropolis. Additionally, the universities and research facilities educate new highly skilled professionals every year. So the role of the techno technological innovation with special respect to the production and distribution of hydrogen is very crucial. 
Hydrogen is a relatively new resource which not much research experience behind it. So new research findings and innovation allow us a climate neutral hydrogen production, so-called green hydrogen production. It also makes the production and the distribution of hydrogen more efficient. Over time, innovation allows us a more versatile application of hydrogen. So the key element for supply and storage of energies within the European Green Deal is hydrogen. The scope of application ranges from energy storage for regenerative energy to use in mobility, trains, cars and ships, to heat generation or to use it in industry. Moreover, hydrogen can be an intermediate stage for the sustainable production of basic chemicals and fuels. This makes hydrogen an important component of a future decarbonized economy. So the most imp important task in the hydrogen market is to transfer the complex and knowledge intensive technologies from advanced basic research to marketable product and to ensure the clean production of hydrogen. Is it therefore also suitable for international collaboration? So a subsidiary of the Rural Regional Association is already active in this field, and this is an example uh, that works. Our waste incineration plant has been producing electricity and district heating for many households and for business for years. So now we are going to build our own hydrogen filling station for the waste truck collection. Through this, we will create a cycle. The waste collection trucks pick up the waste. The waste is used to generate hydrogen and the waste collection trucks use the hydrogen again for transportation. So we go from diesel with carbon dioxide emissions to hydrogen fuel without carbon dioxide emissions. We will produce in this filling station hydrogen for about 40 million car kilometers or 4 million truck kilometers each year. So you can see the incineration and the hydrogen gas station in the picture above. So lessons learned. What is the lessons learned? The balance between economic development and preservation of the industrial core is to, to, uh, to set. The, we, must, uh, we have to reinventing the core industry of a region without giving up on its traditions. And uh, we have to compromising for structural and social economical weaknesses. So the conclusion is development is in the right direction, but there is also a lot of unused potential. So we must go on. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Marcus. Um, you said previously uh, innovation uh, bridges are being built um, from the rural to all over the world. Uh, uh, does it include Canada? So, Maybe yes. So to finish this world tour of presentations, I, I would like to take you to Canada in a region uh, that is reinventing its industry base. Uh, welcome to Edmonton uh, metropolitan region. Brent, uh, the floor is yours. And please. Thank you, Karen. 10 minutes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, I'm very happy to be here today to speak to about some of the exciting initiatives underway within the Edmonton metropolitan region. Uh, but first, our region sits on Treaty 6 territory, which is a traditional meeting grounds, gathering place, and traveling route for the Cree, Soto, Blackfoot, Métis, Dene, and, and Nakota Sioux. And we acknowledge all the many First Nation, Métis, and Inuit whose foot, footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. Uh, my colleague Brent Jensen spoke earlier today about our region's world-class uh, capabilities in the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning. And again, Edmonton Global represents 15 municipalities within the Edmonton metropolitan region. I'll be speaking about our region's efforts in another area of technology, uh, like my, my uh, previous presenter, clean energy and specifically hydrogen. And uh, right now, a big part of our focus is around the radical transformation of the region's economy to position it for the net zero expectations of government, industry, and society. Uh, we've already heard from Marcus uh, from the Ruhr region. The hydrogen opportunity has resulted in new hubs, clusters, valleys to support the build out of key infrastructure to link hydrogen supply and hydrogen demand. And within Canada, the Edmonton region is the recipient of a high degree of focus and an unparalleled level of alignment across government. And I'll speak once, uh, both municipally, provincially, federally, as well as with our indigenous communities. Uh, my talk will explore some of the underlying reasons for this and how uh, we are working to lever this opportunity to achieve long-term economic, social and environmental goals within our region. 
So um, on this slide, first a bit of a background about our region. Uh, we're the Edmonton metropolitan region is Canada's fifth largest economy and the fastest growing region within Canada. Uh, with over 1.4 million people and a span of approximately 100,000 square kilometers, our region is home to a very diverse industrial base and abundant natural resources. Our region is connected to global markets through an extensive network structure, including energy pipelines, both of Canada's national rail lines, uh, highway corridors connecting our oil and gas, agricultural and forestry resources, as well as an international airport. Uh, because of our central location and access to resources, we have become the centre of Canada's petrochemical industry and other sectors looking to add value to their natural resources. And as mentioned during uh, my colleague's Working Group 1 presentation, our region is fueled by world-class uh, research in areas like life science technology, engineering and artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, and that builds on the long-term investments of our in our post-secondary institutions like the University of Alberta. We're also home to some of the leading industrial scale demonstrations of clean energy technologies with significant investments from our provincial and national innovation partners. Next slide, please. Um, YEG, I don't think you can see it necessarily on this slide, but uh, what the letters YEG is our International Air Transport Association code for the airport associated with our region. Uh, it also symbolizes the value of our region, young, educated and growing. The Edmonton metropolitan region is young, we're one of the youngest regions in Canada have, and have been celebrated as the best community for youth and youth work. We're educated from pre-kindergarten to PhDs. Our region is among the most educated in the world. There's over 130,000 students enrolled in universities and colleges within the region. And increasingly, we're attracting large numbers of foreign students. We also recognized, we're recognized as one of the most entrepreneurial regions in Canada. And finally, we're growing, already one of the largest economic centers in Canada with a regional GDP of over $105 billion Canadian. We are the fastest growing region in the country and Alberta is the fastest growing jurisdiction in North America. In export growth, our region is outpacing the Canadian average by more than two to one. Uh, in fact, we lead the nation with a growth rate of 10.5, or 10, sorry, 10.8 percent in global exports and much of that is driven by our manufacturing sector. So this presentation will focus on the steps our region is taking to transform our industrial economy. Uh, but to understand the challenge, we need to understand the history and previous efforts to transition and diversify the region's economy. Uh, and this has certainly been a long-term effort for our province and for our region. And I can remember even myself doing my own work on my master's thesis 30 years ago now. At, at that time, we saw many of uh, we saw one of many subsequent collapses in global oil prices, and the need to diversify the economy back then was seen as an urgent task. So our region has been at the center of the oil and gas economy and uh, we are more than familiar with its cyclical nature. Resource booms over the last years and perhaps even a or sorry, resource booms may last years or perhaps a decade and they're inevitably followed by sharp drops in commodity prices resulting in significant regional economic recessions. Uh, despite the somewhat regular occurrence of the bus, uh, we have not done a great job at making some of the transformational industrial infrastructure that would insulate us from future resource cycles of this nature. So efforts have been traditionally focused uh, more on an, I call it an incremental nature, investing in more efficient process, production processes or singular efforts to reduce environmental impacts. Such investments are viewed as part, uh, tend to be viewed as part of a zero sum game system where any investments by government in one type of project or sector have, have often been viewed as less resources for a different company or sector. Our political systems, federally and provincially, are often driven by conflict rather than collaboration as governments tend to be rewarded for, quote, standing up to Ottawa, our federal government, or by the federal government getting tough on the oil and gas sector. So as you can expect, this type of political atmosphere makes it very challenging uh, for governments to provide a collaborative, shared long-term vision around industrial or energy development. And despite our best efforts, Canada was unable to capitalize on other similar topics like liquefied natural gas or LNG, uh, that trend over the past decade, with only one significant project approved uh, during that period. The result has been seen a significant drop in global investments, about $30 billion per year on average in our energy sector since 2014. Uh, when the last major drop in oil prices has occurred. And of course, we're seeing prices come up again, but question as to uh, how sustained that will be. Next slide, please. So what factors are resulting in a structural shift in our industrial systems within the Edmonton region? 
there's a significant shift in the mindset that is taking place within our region that mirrors, I think, what's taking place globally. Those looking to enter into the workforce no longer want to be working in the traditional carbon emitting energy sector, rather they want to be part of the climate change solution. So while our energy companies have been leading in finding new innovative ways of producing an oil and gas, it wasn't always obvious how they were contributing to a future net zero economy. We weren't able to attract our young leaders uh, to these professions uh, that were often viewed as yesterday's industries. So clearly that is now changing as hydrogen is clearly a central part of the drive to net zero globally and domestically. Uh, from the investment perspective, environmental, social and go social governance policies or what we call ESG, are having an impact on investment decisions. While our region has seen a reduction in foreign direct investment since 2014, these trends are now beginning to reverse as we are seen as one of the leading global centers for investment in the future hydrogen economy and the significant reductions in greenhouse gas emissions that come with it. The ESG commitment also means we must have meaningful opportunities for the participation of indigenous communities and that they must be beneficiaries in the energy transformation in a manner that they may not have been in past oil and gas investment cycles. Within the energy, or sorry, within the Edmonton region, uh, hydrogen hub, uh, two First Nations and uh, what's known as the Alberta Indigenous Investment Corporation, uh, or sorry, Alberta Indigenous Opportunities Corporation, are all partners, and the expectation is that they will be full partners in future projects to produce net zero hydrogen, to use it, and in the hydrogen supply chain. So finally, and perhaps most importantly, we're seeing a desire to support the energy transition through large industry scale projects. This is not about pilot projects to prove out a technology, but is now about showing the ability to move quickly to produce net zero hydrogen at the scale needed to drive glo global greenhouse gas emission reductions. It's also about leveraging some past commitments by industry and government investments, such as the Alberta Carbon Trunk Line, committed to by federal and provincial governments nearly a decade ago and where we have already developed a supportive regulatory framework around things like pore space ownership and accountability for long-term liabilities associated with CCS projects, carbon capture and storage projects. And while we now have a level of alignment amongst industry in the energy transition, including commitments from our major oil and gas producers toward net zero emissions by 2050, something that was really unfathomable just a few years ago. So the opportunity associated with the hydrogen economy is increasingly being understood by all stakeholders. We're seeing the mobilization of the investment community around this transition, which will be valued in the trillions of dollars. We have an opportunity to make use of low cost resources like natural, natural gas, turning it from an almost wasted resource to a critical input and enabler of the hydrogen economy. The opportunity involves our world-class geological resources for CO2 storage, which has already been proven at an industrial scale by global leaders like Shell. And as mentioned, the climate, tri climate crisis requires a degree of scaling that we have not seen before. And while many jurisdictions uh, have an interest in making a contribution, our region clearly has the experience and the history of being able to work at the scale needed in this transformation. And just uh, earlier this month, this opportunity was recognized by the global leader in hydrogen production air products when it chose Edmonton as the location for its first net zero hydrogen production facility globally. One of the key differentiators for hydrogen is need to make use of the existing oil and gas supply chain, which we feel can more easily pivot to the hydrogen opportunity than some other alternative energy technologies. Our experience in being able to move hydrogen throughout the economy uh, is not dissimilar from our experience in oil and gas. And as mentioned, because these issues and other issues, or because of these issues and other issues, we're seeing an unprecedented level of alignment across all governments, something that did not exist for other energy topics over the past three decades at least. This, uh, there's awareness and recognition that this is an area where Canada can make a difference and where all parts of the nation are able to contribute, whether it's our oil and gas jurisdictions in Western Canada or our low-cost hydro resources in provinces like Quebec and British Columbia and elsewhere. Next slide. So if we are really making, uh, so if we're really making use of some existing assets like our natural gas, our geology and our expertise, what's the innovation here? Uh, we've had most of all of the pieces of the puzzle, but they weren't being connected. We didn't have the awareness, the incentives, the mechanisms to see the bigger picture and to be able to pursue it aggressively. So in this case, the innovation is more about social innovation uh, or processes for bringing our, our key partners together. This happened when a not-for-profit organization known as the Transition Accelerator worked to bring together our region's municipalities together with federal and provincial governments. Our innovation system and industry came together to explore the opportunity and work towards a node-based strategy or now what's known as our hubs. or uh, hubs to develop a shared vision of the hydrogen opportunity and understand its scale and opportunity. The opportunity involves conducting 
are connecting our low carbon hydrogen production capabilities with our ability to aggregate and scale up uh, our demand for hydrogen. This means for the first time we're bringing together groups like commercial fleet operators, municipal transit fleets, operators of combined heat and power facilities and electric and gas utilities uh, to map out the future, future stage. So while this work is ongoing, there was alignment amongst these diverse groups that the clean hydrogen opportunity is something that fits within all of their respective business plans. So we think that by having a collaboratively developed transparent plan, we can catalyze the region to make smart investment decisions and ensure our funding bodies within the province, provincial and federal governments support the bigger picture. Next slide. So our innovation also involves creating what we're calling a market sounding mechanism for bringing groups together to share perspectives on the hydrogen opportunity, present a base case to catalyze the discussion. What we found is that the process allows for the uncovering of opportunities, whether it's on hydrogen production, hydrogen demand, or some of the enabling infrastructure that allows us to expand the solution space and accelerate the build out of demand. The market sounding mechanism also allows us to drill into some of the key spots along the value chain where the decision on how we implement things like hydrogen fueling stations can drive the actions of our vehicle owners and operators and ultimately attract investment from companies like OEMs. The market sounding process will also target our government funding bodies. In Canada, over $10 billion will be made available for the energy transition and a major portion of this will go towards critical hydrogen infrastructure. The hub's market sounding process will help government funders determine where their dollars will have the greatest impact, helping them focus on the environmental and economic outcomes they're looking to support. Next slide, please. So what we've learned, or what have we learned from the hub process? We need to understand that uh, uh, that is still the early days and our hub was only formally announced just three months ago, but I think there are a few key learnings from the 12 month process to get to us to this point. First, and I can't emphasize enough the importance of courageous leadership at all levels of government. We've seen this leadership within our region where we've had five municipal leaders come together to pursue the opportunity, regardless of which municipalities ultimately receive the direct benefits associated with investment. We have all seen leadership at the provincial and federal with leaders agreeing on the importance of collaboration rather than on pursuing some of the more confrontational approaches we've seen in the past. And our successful approaches have been due to the transparent technical analysis undertaken by partners like the Transition Accelerator. And we have seen our government partners come together to use the hub's analysis to inform existing and new programs to support the hydrogen transition. What I want to leave you is that this approach is not about just creating what we call a technology sandbox, but rather it's about creating a safe space for transformational discussions. One where we can create a shared vision of the future and an understanding of the critical interdependencies for achieving this vision. The hub serves as a focus, focal point that catalyzes partnerships and provides a platform for the energy systems innovation. So with that, uh, thank you all. And I turn the floor back to Karen. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Brent. Well, uh, Edmonton is a perfect example of what we are talking about today. And I think your presentation is an excellent transition to the second, second part of our session. So um, we, we lost about 60 people who have disconnected, so probably from Asia and because they went to bed. And we, we expect maybe more Americans to join, but we'll see. Anyway, I can see that the chat is very dynamic. So maybe I, I'll be back to the chat because I, I, I've, I've seen very interesting questions in here. But um, well, for, for this roundtable, uh, I have to say that we are delighted to welcome Essa. Hi, Essa, you're, you're here with us. I think Harry, uh, he's still with us too. Wonderful. Uh, so you, you, your guys will represent Finland, Tambere. Uh, as we only have 30 minutes, so we really need to, to finish before uh, a quarter past six in France, in Europe, uh, I, I would ask you to try to be precise, but brief, really. So I, I'd like to start with a couple of questions uh, linked to the theme of our working group. Um, so maybe I, I'll ask the same question to three of you um, in a row. Um, Marcus, uh, Veronique and, and Brent, uh, throughout history, uh, industry has had to reinvent uh, itself. What is different this time? Marcus, what do you think? One minute. 
Uh, oh, <laughs> this time is the pace and the development of the framework is a completely new experience. Um, so in the past, I think pollution used to be accepted. The known about the danger to humans and to the climate was uh, only little. And due to global networking and the further development of uh, research, uh, the new factors come to the fore. Environmental production and resource saving production are the new outstanding topics for industrial production. And so I think people pay more attention to ecological products and ecological production methods. Information on environmental pollution and the consequences of environmental pollution is available in real time via internet uh, all over the world. So we have to rethink uh, many areas of industry. The best way to do this is to exchange ideas, uh, so we do today and uh, around the world. Sorry. Yes, uh, <laughs> I was mute. So thank you, Marcus. Thank you very much. So uh, Veronique, uh, would you like to pick up on that? <laughs> so what's, what's different this time? Uh, your mic. Your mic, uh, Veronique. Here? OK. Yeah. OK, OK. OK. So this time, uh, it's not only this time, it has not happened overnight i would say even though the pandemic probably um, yeah. crystallized things and sped up lots of things but as um, uh, he said environment 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 that's and the uh, you know sustainability that's also that's definitely one important issue then uh, of course because of the pandemic we just were uh, even more aware of the um, necessity to actually have a regional supply chain uh, and uh, how we were really so highly dependent on sources that could really, that are not 100% reliable, that could be uh, overcome with uh, uh, some issues like a pandemic or a volcano or whatever it is. And we can see that, for example, uh, nowadays with semiconductors and how uh, there's a, a huge shortage of uh, com uh, components, especially for the electric car industry. And the third uh, very important, I think, uh, factor also uh, is digitalization. Uh, nowadays, we are all here in a, in a you know, dematerials uh, webinar, whatever it is, uh, but it has definitely accelerated uh, the digitalization of the industrial process as well as the whole society. So uh, whether it's good or bad, uh, we really can see it in practical details now. Thank you, thank you, Veronique. Uh, Brent, again, what do you think? Sure, yeah, and I spoke of to a few of, of these as well, and I think similar to uh, to Marcus in the rural region, um, you know, and, and within Canada, you know, we've, we've now seen a degree of alignment around how we're responding from a regulatory nature to, to and we see a long-term signals where will carbon charges be in our country uh, by 2030 and that's really driving those investment decisions and I think in the past we didn't have that longer term perspective and, and that's coupled now with the, the zero net zero commitments from our industry and again that's coming quite recently just this month uh, some major emitters uh, within Canada talking about net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 uh, so it's no longer about let's make some incremental improvements and in efficiencies and reducing intensities you know we can see the goal lines and where we need to be and that's certainly motivated by society expectations and I think what's also different on hydrogen is we see that economic opportunity in our in our jurisdiction where we can be part of that providing that solution and it's a very significant uh, uh, opportunity whether it's trillions of dollars globally or within Canada you know a hundred billion dollars so it catalyzes the focus on let's be part of that solution rather than uh, fighting it so uh, and I think just lastly on hydrogen we're seeing that connection between supply and demand that we don't necessarily see in other areas where we're exporting fossil fuels. Uh, we still want to be an exporter of hydrogen, but we also know we have to build out the domestic uh, uh, demand, the domestic market for hydrogen. So that's really what's driving things as well that may be a bit different in this case. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Brent. So uh, the second question, uh, quite similar. So uh, as you know, HLF uh, has uh, its genesis uh, in the idea that innovation ecosystems can always improve uh, their practices. So we, we're discussing reinvention of industry. Okay, but what is the most important uh, current challenge uh, your ecosystem should, should face to reinvent itself 
today. So uh, for this question, I would ask uh, maybe uh, Essa, uh, Jani Krishna, and Richard, even if Richard, you already uh, addressed this, this question in your talk. So Essa, please. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Harry already gave a nice overview of, of Tampere's uh, um, current situation and, uh, and the background for where we are. About the current challenges, uh, obviously, we need to start uh, when we talk about uh, uh, the most important challenges we are facing. Obviously, they are sustainability related, the climate change and all the carbon, carbon neutrality related goals and uh, and the opportunities in the in our ecosystem and uh this is a uh, of course huge opportunity for us european union is investing a lot uh, and promoting this digital and green transition how can we as a, as a still small uh, european country and, and small european ecosystem uh, utilize uh, these these opportunities and be fast enough and be among the front runners and and be the market leaders and how can we help our companies uh, to 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 tackle these challenges and utilize utilize new opportunities to to serve as an attractive uh, test platform and partner uh, and investment destination for for green and digital investments and of course industrial circular economy is a huge opportunity as well and then demographic challenges uh, we are in 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 the middle of historical rapid urbanization in Finland and Tampere is, is, uh, is uh, together with Helsinki region uh, where it, it's mainly happening in Finland and also our population is aging very very rapidly so uh, so uh, we are we have been depending on on domestic growth and that's will that's about to reach its limit uh, by uh, end of uh, 2040s. So we need to be more attractive internationally. We need to be able to attract foreign talent to maintain this growth that Harry was nicely describing, uh, the Tampere's growth path. And foreign students, like in the case of Silicon Valley, was was mentioned in the chat. That's we have a that's a big opportunity for us. Uh, we have a a lot of foreign uh, students here how, how can we maintain them keep them here in the region then obviously there are covid 19 uh, uh, recovery uh, related challenges and uh, how we can uh, kind of restart our our uh, there for example in our our emerging very interesting young startup ecosystem they have of course the the crisis hit hard our small companies how we can we can start rebuilding and and recovering after the uh, a crisis and also to strengthen our position in European and global value chains and European innovation uh, networks. And well, then finally, the digitalization, sorry. obviously, that's a big opportunity, but also that, that that's, uh, that's a, a challenge as well uh, for our traditional industry. But that's in, in brief from Tampere uh, point you. of view, the main Thank challenges. Thank you, SS. So, you know, finding solutions starts with uh, uh, knowing uh, the problems. And for that, uh, I can see you, you're on the right path. Uh, so, Jani Krishna, uh, what, what do you think? So, I think the demographic uh, problem uh, uh, is also one of your problems. Uh, am I right? And so, is yeah. it a challenge um, for your ecosystem as well? Right, and I think uh, uh, when you're doing something like this, uh, is is that not uh, one one man or one agency job? Is it is a team effort that you need uh, co-commitment and 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 uh, a common vision together. So I would say uh, doing it together and keep the fellowship intact is one challenge, and do it fast enough because of digitization, because of globalization, things are changing fast so doing fast enough is another challenge and uh doing it in in a way that uh each transaction everything that you do add on to the previous thing that you do so it's become a platform not not just a simple transaction and keeping up with all this growing uh, uh broader and broader scope every day that so you you're doing it is a challenge and i think uh, we can tackle that by collaborations and open open eye open ears open heart thank you sure sure richards uh 
You finish this tour. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Karen. Basically, I think that the biggest challenges right now, one, I have two. One is really saying the same thing that my colleagues have been saying, but using different words. We need somehow to develop tools to measure the quality of growth as well as the amount of production that's increased because sustainability and social inclusiveness all amount to the quality of the impact that these innovations will have. We don't have good measurement tools yet. The other thing that I think is an issue is infrastructure, and this has to do with the public sector uh, kind of innovator uh, relationships. I mentioned this in the chat, but I'm, you know, we had 30 years for the internet to develop using uh, kind of a natural evolution, and we don't have that much time to develop new energy systems. We really need to have some way for the public sector infrastructure to enable the bigger systems development around these new energies, and, and it's a hard task. Thank you very much, Richard. Very, very fair comments. So now I, I would like to, to focus my questions on your uh, ecosystem specificities or some of your ecosystem specificities, uh, challenges and, and the lessons learned. So um, Veronique, you, you describe you described a Grenoble ecosystem as a triple uh, helix innovation model uh, with the research, higher education and industry of equal weight. Uh, these three forces uh, converge to, to create job. Uh, how can upstream research and innovation translate into industrial jobs for everyone in a local community? <laughs> Yeah, that's definitely a key the, question the because <laughs> I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Can yeah, you yeah. hear me? Go okay. Ahead. Sorry. Yeah, that's definitely a very important question yes. because uh, as being close to some policymakers, I mean, people uh, they they kept being asked the question. Okay, this is very fine. I mean, you guys are creating highly qualified jobs with engineers, with researchers. What about local people? I mean, what about normal court people? And how do we make sure that there's, a, as I say, a spillover effect? So, um, and this is not easy because basically, yes, uh, first of all, the jobs that are being created by innovation uh, are, uh, lots of them are highly qualified jobs. So you can answer this by saying that some of this industry that just create high added value products has actually a more important spillover effect. For example, semiconductors, there's been some studies that have been conducted that says that for one job created in semiconductor industry, then you have four jobs created in the supply chain or in um, local uh, community business like, uh, I don't know, bakery or uh, uh, physicians or whatever. But I think it's not enough yet to, to answer this. It's just as I, and that's why I emphasize also the fact that uh, the, the innovation has also to be um, thought over uh, with um, production process as well. And the other uh, tricky thing is to be able to, and that was one of the examples I showcased, is how do we make sure that the really great startups that are being created uh, from our innovation community uh, are able to scale up and to actually uh, being you know set up some production sites very close and uh, because and I have to say it keeps happening lots of I mean sometimes you know you just create these great startups with highly qualified jobs and you keep the research center and then uh, the production is actually being reshored somewhere else where the labor costs are cheaper. And uh, that's, uh, that's definitely, I don't have any easy answer, uh, but to really make sure that uh, you, uh, you create added value, that you try to get as much as possible uh, regional supply chain and uh, but on the other hand, to make sure that your local industry addresses the global markets. So I'm not sure I answer correctly because I 
don't think I have any ready-made answer. And that's one thing uh, that where it's very important to actually exchange with some of uh, partners on a global level and see how they address this issue with different answers. So anyone, anyone's going to an answer because uh, I was about to ask the same question to Richard, but so uh, because I think the, the few giants in, in traditional industries you mentioned uh, that exist in the Silicon Valley. So this industry has to survive in in the valley to to also provide work for all classes of societies. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's true. One of the comments that just came in on chat was about the need for an economy that supports blue collar workers as well as people at the pinnacle of the innovation side. That's absolutely correct. And I don't really think we have a good solution for that yet. But I think that there's more attention being paid to it, which is good. I think people are looking for solutions. And uh, if we can get people focused on the quality of sustainability and of uh, society um it's the only direction we can go we just have to move faster than we're doing now thank you richard brent brent do, do, do you want to yeah no i i really agree with you know richard richard's mm -hmm. comment and, and veronique's comment as well and we certainly don't have answers uh but i think you know we look at the the hydrogen opportunity it really does speak to that um, you know, I'm not sure it's retraining, to be honest, it's probably, you know, utilizing the skill sets that we have, and that's going to be really very important, and, you know, even in, in our jurisdiction, to fund some of the retraining programs that will be needed, you know, we need resources coming back to government, and, and that's actually from royalty dollars that we do get from, let's say, natural gas production, so it really plays a critical role within that overall circle, uh, and it really being maybe a little more focused this time on that retraining opportunity, and when I talk about retraining, you know, it's not just in the te technology technology focus areas, but business, entrepreneurship, those areas we need to do a much better job at. We have I think we haven't been as successful as we would like to uh, pursue some of these clean energy opportunities because we don't have maybe the experience uh, that we can get from Silicon Valley or from other parts of the world in pivoting uh, companies you know, into clean tech, for example. Uh, so I think hydrogen gives us a great opportunity to do things maybe in a way uh, more aggressively than we've been able to in the past, but uh, you know, we do need to look at some other approaches around training and, and that's something the hub's beginning to look at as well within our, our Edmonton region. Thank you. Thank you, Brent. Thank you very much. So, well, uh, af after the challenge of um, um, employment, um, now I would like to address the, the importance of incentives uh, from governments. So maybe I'll, I'll ask Harry or Essa. Um, so governments are, are often said to be one blade of the triple helix model. Uh, so can investment-based industry exist without government subsidies? Uh, so, Harry, you said Tampere has always been the challenger inside Finland as, and has never enjoyed significant governmental support. So, how, how come? Well, uh, uh, maybe the so, uh, important this... word is... Do you hear me? Yes, yeah. maybe the important maybe the important word is significant because, uh, of course, in every single region, I think all over the world, there is some public funding, some governmental support. But uh, okay. in in Tampere, in Tampere region, it has always been uh, more or less on top of private investment. After the private investment, after the private initiative, and the governmental funding has been a little bit less than in some other regions. There are many reasons for this. Maybe there are politicians who have thought that the uh, well-performing challenger region, they can survive without so much public funding. And maybe there has been a lot of politicians which come from other regions, because this is industrial region. This has not grown too much governmental politicians. Uh, the, the politicians have come from other regions in, in, in Finland. Uh, people in Tampere tend to uh, focus on business, um, universities, professorships, or, or whatever, in innovating something, not too much doing administration. And uh, maybe Esa has more elaboration. Esa. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Harry and Karen. Uh, just maybe a little bit of, from the, also from the background when we have had a lot of, changes and uh, 
and, and, and transformation in, in our, our innovation ecosystem and industry. And uh, some after the Nokia uh, collapse of the Nokia cluster, so we kind of uh, ditched the, the old cluster policies and moved towards increasingly towards open innovation platforms and co-creation, where now DMEC is, is playing a, a leading role as, as, a, as a platform for, for co-creation in industry. So we started to talk about these co-creation platforms and open innovation platforms already a long time ago. And now, uh, now also increasingly about ecosystems. And that Tampere has been regarded as a kind of an example in, in Finland for that kind of new kind of a, uh, innovation policy. And now finally also that is kind of recognized, but uh, not just for the benefit of Tampere, but uh, as part of our national new national R&D and innovation policy where this kind of a partnership model uh, uh, between uh, public and private sectors is emphasized. And then especially the role of cities and, and local ecosystems. And uh, just a few months ago, uh, that was a major initiative by the Finnish government, uh, so-called ecosystem agreements between the state and cities, the, the leading university cities were signed for for next seven years. And uh, there's some 10 million uh, euros per year uh, granted by the government as kind of a seed money. And then the cities and regions are expected to invest uh, the same amount. Then, of course, that should act as a catalyst also for, for, for other R&D funding from the, for the private and, and, and European Union funding. And uh, that was we kind of served as a, as, a, as a model for also, I think, okay. for, the, for the Finnish government on that. And that's an interesting new opportunity also mm -hmm. for for us but then also our local government support through our, yes. especially through our smart tampere program and its ecosystem that is now cur currently under revision oh okay thank you yes Qu of quite the same uh, uh, here uh, uh, in grenoble so uh, Jenny krishna uh, w would you like to pick up on that Viv? what's your model in thailand so is the the money uh, the money earned uh, from traditional industries reinvested uh, in your new strategy and uh, with uh, what kind of process well uh, i guess the 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 most important part uh, that forced the industry to reform or reinvent itself would be the market force okay then and i think uh, the industry in thailand start realizing that uh, if they don't do anything they will be wiping out so that is the, the most important things. And mm -hmm. uh, 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 earlier, you are touching on the point of government incentives. And I think government incentive is nice and is, uh, it would mean something to the business, but it's not as important as the value creations that the ecosystem can provide it to the, the industries or the, the business. So I, if I, have it in my ways i would rather advise the government to spend monies into enriching the eco ecosystem than just giving away to uh, to industries okay brent i guess that my comment thank you thank you very much John maybe, like, maybe brent, just, you had to, to add something yeah just maybe briefly on incentives is something we're giving a lot of thought to and, and i think the value of hubs uh, hydrogen hubs uh, is to how do we catalyze a more systematic approach to incentives? Uh, I don't want to speak necessarily on behalf of governments, but you know we have programs being administered by multiple departments, so they might focus on I'll call it one part of the elephant, and no one sees the entire elephant in it, you know its, its entirety. And how do we promote you know that vision where we see you know what what changes we're trying to make, and you know through works of hubs and hydrogen valleys uh, and clusters, we can maybe advise some of the governments on that overall. Uh, system of programming to make it more impactful, particularly given the challenges you know around climate change and moving quickly. Yes, Richard, please. So I think that some things that don't look like incentives are actually incentives. Regulations are one of the tools that governments use mm -hmm. to show what are the important things for the people of the 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 country or the region. And I think that private sector has a responsibility for turning those challenges into new value creation opportunities. That's what the private sector does, but we need the government to be raising awareness and making goals that uh, private sector will find the solutions for. <laughs> 
Yes, <laughs> sure. Thank you, Richard, for adding this. Uh, well, uh, time flies. Um, so, um, we, we, Veronique, you, you mentioned uh, through your presentation the difficulty of citing and fitting in new initiatives uh, with the local environment. Uh, so, maybe this question to, to Marcus, then Richard. So, uh, housing shortage, land shortage, cost of living, cost for operating, overloaded traffic, mobility, pollution, uh, etc. So, how do you? cope with uh, these issues uh, in the rural region and in Silicon Valley. Marcus, if you want to maybe to to say something. Uh, yes, uh, so I think um, first uh, space or areas um, are needed for settlements. Uh, so and however, uh, this area, this space is often a challenge in densely populated cities. That's, uh, that's a problem. And the establishment of companies in the population is also increasingly viewed critically. So you have the noise, you have emissions, you have uh, mobility, and that are all things that play an important role in new settlements. And uh, if a settlement has worked, the connection between the new and the existing companies must be organized. Um, and so to do this, uh, existing networks must be shown in the public. Uh, and uh, so new and old companies can learn from each other. So that's, uh, I think, uh, that's important. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus and Richard, if you would like to add something. So on this there's point. no great solutions that I know of. Mm -hmm. Right now, I think not only places like Silicon Valley and so forth, but you know, the high growth Asian cities have had terrible traffic problems for a long time. And so some ways this kind of overload on the system is an outcome of success but we have to deal with with these issues i think there are some things that will naturally solve themselves people will find new solutions like teleconferencing uh but i think that um the income disparity is the one that i'm worried about the most that people really cannot afford to live here who we really need in our economy and unfortunately, I haven't seen a great solution to this. Thank you very much. So in the remaining time, which is uh, maybe a couple of minutes, I, I would like to initiate a kind of uh, fishing for collaborations. So, uh, it, so you have to, to send emails, you have, and we will uh, uh, connect uh, everybody to each other's and so it, because in trying to address your, your challenges uh, so we see areas for collaborations uh, uh, for the future and so one of the question is uh, what continuing role uh, can we see for inter ecosystem cooperation as a way to increase uh, our ecosystems reinventions and it's obvious that it will be helpful, this kind of uh, uh, inter-ecosystem collaboration. And so who could benefit from uh, your developments and uh, or vice versa? So this is something we, we need to address um, right after this uh, this session, I think. So we need to continue. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to you uh, and we will initiate, uh, re-initiate uh, uh, maybe a couple of case studies for, for the second phase. So I, I'm afraid I really have to say goodbye to you all. Um, it was too short, I have to say. Uh, thank you very much to, for, for your work uh, within this working group number two. It was a real pleasure for, for me. Uh, and my colleague Robert. Uh, Robert is probably uh, joining me for, for the final words of this HLF Connect briefing. Uh, I look forward uh, to uh, continuing um, uh, this, this work with you uh, during phase two. Uh, so Ro Robert, I think we, we have a, a couple of uh, things to say. Uh, uh, together so would you like to we like you know with robert we we are a kind of uh, d duo no duet <laughs> so would you like to start well yeah, first firstly i would like to say uh, 
uh, as you said, uh, Karen, just to thank the, the members of this working group for a great, uh, a great session, to thank all of our 11 uh, ecosystems for actively participating in this in this exercise i think oh, one one thing to say for our uh, those of us uh, those also on the call is that uh, as well as the this webinar there's there've been a number of uh, conference calls uh, between the group and and again uh, many of you who've either uh, had to stay up late or um, or, or got up early uh, we very much appreciate your uh, your your support um <clears throat> I that's okay. Okay, okay, back again. Um, yeah. So yeah, very much like to thank your, you, you for your support. And and as Karen said, uh, this is in a sense this session marks the the end of our first uh, phase of of HLF Connect for for 2021. Uh, we'd like to take forward some some themes to to work on together. There's been a number of uh, uh, of things that have come out of I think of both working groups. I think we've talked a lot about uh, attracting and retaining a talent. That was certainly something that came up in working group one and it's certainly been echoed, I think, in this working group and, and also in, in a lot of the chat that we've uh, seen. So we'd like to take forward a, a few a few themes in addition to really just trying to promote uh, collaboration uh, between the ecosystems on, on specific topics that they may be interested to work in together, but also with our summit in mind to uh, look at some themes that we can uh, explore together uh, for no November. Karen. Yes, and I remind you that the summit uh, will be held from the 7th to the 10th of November in Grenoble in person and that our member ecosystems are invited to attend by invitation. So, it, of course, in order to take into account the eventual impossibility to travel for some regions of the world, we are planning a hybrid format and our members will have the possibility to attend online the internal uh, working sessions. So the program is well uh, on its way and I can already uh, tell you that we will uh, be able to hear impressive uh, testimonies uh, from industry. Uh, they, they will come and tell us about their needs in terms of reinvention to support a resilient society. Goodbye, everybody. It was a real pleasure. Thank you very much. Have a lovely summer. <laughs> Bonne vacances. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny Krishna. Thanks, Brent. Thank you. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. The High Level Forum, the International Network network of innovation ecosystems brings together international executives, decision and policy makers from the worlds of higher education.